All right, so this is being called a round table, but it, it's the same square table that we've been using for all the discussions. And we're going to lead some discussion about what's missing from our understanding of genetic architecture across levels of biological organization. And so our, our panelists have been thinking about that in preparation for this meeting. And I'm, we'll just arbitrarily start at that end of the table and work our way forward. And we, we don't have anybody online. Everybody's here, right? Yeah. How generous of you, Nancy. Thank you. Um, uh, so I'm surprised that during this meeting, we haven't talked about the difference between prediction and um, individual effect. Uh, this like, seemed to be like one of his themes that like front and center, right? Many of the conversations we've had are about variance explained. And uh, depending on what we're looking for, like this, some of the questions that were posed about uh, so the hierarchy of how the causal flow from cellular effect to tissue to organism um, are really colored by whether or not we are trying to, what, what are we trying to understand? What's the question we're asking? I think in this room, right, we care about slightly different things, right? Um, um, and Andy was very explicit about what he's looking for. Um, and I think many of us are interested in complex architecture for very different reasons. I think, I, I don't want to put more, more words in your mouth, Peter, but like right, you, your work are, are centered from estimating variance and uh, understanding population level processes, but many of us in this room care about individual effects, right? And, and the perspective there is, is very different. Um, and they'll also touch on this G by E question that we spend most of the time is talking this morning, right? How individual vicarious sensitivity alleles uh, and how these alleles themselves evolve as a consequence of historical exposure potentially uh, shape how um, how individual respond. And I, I think that's this, this question of prediction versus individual effect, I think is very important. I hope we can talk about this as a, as a panel and as, as a group going forward. Yeah, that, I think that's a, that's a great point. The one thing I, uh, I want to go back to, I think some, something that Alka said earlier about statistical models. I think we've talked we talk a lot about today about this idea of generating new data and do we have enough data to answer these certain questions. And I kind of want to, you know, poke a little bit at saying that maybe we don't have the right statistical methods either to think about some of these questions, particularly across multiple scales. Um, especially as I think about ways to integrate information across those scales. Um, and so, you know, you think about, you know, do I have models that will explain something, you know, things I think about on the on a SNP gene pathway network like level. Uh, but then you also think about, you know, do we have a theoretical frameworks that also are, are in place for us to, as a foundation to build those methods upon? Um, and so hopefully we can talk a little bit about some of those questions as well. Hi. Um, so so we've we've got um, prediction and methods, and then now, now I want to talk about phenotypes. So I think in the previous session there were several people who brought up, you know, how how come we haven't talked about like definitions of, uh, you know, either diseases or endophenotypes or what is it that we're looking at, and uh, in in at different levels of biological organization, um, it is expected that um, those that are closer um, to genetic facts are going to have like, you know, much more explainable uh, genetic findings. And, and, and one of the, one of the questions that, you know, oh, is, is on, on the thing now, uh, which is some endophenotypes or molecular phenotypes have surprisingly complex architectures. So, we, so there's a several things to think about there. One is, um, are we looking at the right um, endophenotypes? If they are so complex, maybe they're not what we're, what we're looking for. And also, you know, if, um, uh, and, and this brings up all of the other things about, you know, pleiotropy and, and, and polygenicity and all, multiple things um, having convergent effects on a single phenotype. So we could talk more about phenotypes in this discussion as well. Um, yeah, so I don't know how much sort of new new stuff I have to add, but I have really loved a lot of the conversations that have been going on. Um, so from this question of what's missing from our understanding of genetic architecture across levels of biological organization, um, I think that, you know, there's still data missing and especially sort of comparable data sets. So we've, you know, talked a lot about and one of the questions is about this idea that maybe intermediate molecular phenotypes might have different genetic architectures, maybe simpler genetic architectures. Um, I think that often the inferences that we're making about that are coming from studies with very, very different um, amounts of power um, across very different um, sort of types of people. And I, you know, I think that we're all converging maybe on some um, sort of basic principles, but um, I think that it would be sort of nice to get us all uh, talking about whether we really do think that we've we've nailed down the fact that there are different um, genetic architectures across different levels of, of biological organization. Um, I think also across different scales of biological organization, we're often thinking about different um, sort of 
mechanistic uh, and generative processes. So at the, um, the level of molecular QTL, as we um, heard about this morning, we often do sort of have a, more of a mechanistic biological model about this thing binds to this thing and it changes gene regulation um, in this way. And I would like to see you know, more connection of that. We would all like to see more connection of those um, sort of mechanistic and, and generative processes with some of the, um, the larger scale levels of biological organization. And I think um, we're all interested in, in how we get there. And I'd love to sort of keep that discussion going. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers. It's just awesome being here and being part of this fabulous day. Um, you know, I'm really excited about the next 10 years um, because I feel like we're entering a sort of post-discovery. I know we're, we're still going to be discovering, but now that we've got hundreds of variants for every trait, I think it's time to start really doing some really interesting biology with them. And, and to me, the major question is, what's the variance of allelic effects? Uh, themselves. So, so we've talked a lot this morning about variants across contexts, but even within a context, there's a really big question as to how variable is an effect for an individual with, with the same genotype. So two, and I, and I think probably um, functional biology can inform that. Um, so what I mean by that is things like EQTL um, give us a different perspective on what genotypes are doing. So at one extreme, you have a model, which I call a sort of Kaplunk model. So Kaplunk's this game where you have these sticks holding up marbles. And the aim of the game is to pull out the sticks until you get to a point where one stick comes out and then all the marbles fall through. So the analogy would be disease would be sort of held up, held at bay by all the sticks, which are the, the GWAS sits. And then for each individual iteration of the game, one particular stick is the one that really matters. So in that model, individual effects are really... Uh, very, very small for most people with, with the SNP, but really big for a particular person who had me had a particular exposure or just by chance that was a big effect. The other extreme is that allelic effects are really the same across for everybody. Everybody with an extra allele of this has an extra millimeter of height and that's uniform. So addressing that question to me is critical. And the way I think about it, looking at EQTL across contexts. So, so when we did our work in Morocco a bunch of years ago, we found hundreds of EQTL in the blood what struck me was that there was absolutely no G by E for individual allelic effects, even though the different environments had really different means of expression. So there was just parallel differences. So each genotype was the same effect, even though the magnitude uh, or the absolute levels of expression were very much uh, culturally context uh, uh, dependent. And if you think about that, it actually means that most individuals in any group with uh, the risk alleles have pretty much the same expression of people with the protective genotypes, okay? So the vast majority of people are, have actually the same gene expression, and there's only extreme individuals uh, in one of the environments. And so that sort of sets up the possibility of genotype environment interactions at the phenotype that you actually don't observe at the molecular level and raises the idea of what I call common variants of rare effect, because only a few individuals with that risk genotype are the ones that are extreme. So in my conception, that's sort of one way that we can think about using molecular cell biology to really study the relationship between genotypes and um, phenotypes by asking, you know, what is the effect of the genotype on the biology of, this, of, of the gene expression trait, and then linking that to cellular phenotypes. So I'll stop there, I've got some other thoughts. So I think it would be, <laughs> it would be great to, so everybody should feel free to respond to the issues that, that others have raised, but also to address some of the specific questions. You know, we've talked a bit about pleiotropy and, um, and how the same phenotype like age might sometimes be a cellular context, might sometimes be a much more organismal context. Um, we talked about, you know, is it really true that, that intermediate how is it, what is it about phenotypes that drive the complexity and, and potentially the, um, the challenges of understanding genetic architecture? Um, phenotypes like BMI or major depression maybe have a lot more opportunities for input from environmental exposures then we even know and understand. Um, and so those are, that's another way to think of complexity with respect to the phenotype. Um, 
there were some important questions raised about how we think of the analytic models and, and how the scales may be different across the genetics and non-genetic um, exposures and, and more, more ways that we need to think about better modeling um, and, and the dynamic processes. So let's, let's go back through um, and people should feel free to respond. And then, so after that, we'll we'll open up for more questions and discussion. Um, yeah, so I just had an extra thought there, I guess. Um, temporal dependency of allelic effects is, I think, really, really critical. And particularly in terms of the buffering, that word was used this morning, um, of effects over the life course. So are you exposed to disease response to that disease by changing gene expression? And I think that's a critical element that we cannot get to with in vitro systems because it's just the whole body, the whole organism is responding. The extra perspective I have on that is whether or not, you know, under persistent stabilizing selection, you can actually evolve systems that are robust. So, so technically, I use the term canalization in the con mean to mean evolved robustness and evolved stability. So, is it possible that 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 actually persistent stabilizing selection leads to change in the genetic architecture in such a way that um, you tend to promote that stability? And, and, and buffering, um, you know, modeling done by people like um, Sean Rice, Gunter and Andreas Wagner uh, and others it is pertinent in that regard. Yeah, um, so maybe going back to some of the, the questions that are up here and um, especially this ongoing discussion um, about pleiotropy. Um, during uh, Naomi's talk, I was wondering sort of whether we could use some of the interesting observations about pleiotropy that we're getting from GWAS, like the, um, the fact that there are some of these variants that seem to break the um, relationship between uh, minor allele frequency and effect size um, scaling and sort of go after those functionally and try to learn about them, um, given that they seem like they are probably really important phenotypically, um, that they are going to be affecting some things positively, some things negatively, um, and sort of, sort of work backwards from um, things that seem to break some of the sort of common uh, GWAS patterns or some of the common um, ways that we think variants in complex traits should behave. So what are the outliers? Maybe we can do some functional experiments with them and try to learn more about um, their biology. Um, so I want to respond to something what well, Nancy was talking about, G by E, um, just now some environments, well, depression being one of those things that uh, is affected quite a lot by, for example, um, early life stress and stuff like that. So, um, so I think in the morning, uh, there was a few discussions on on how um, linking, for example, G by E uh, results with TWAS results, uh, that would be able to link, for example, environmental um, uh, effects to complex disorders. And uh, one of the things that is, um, that I think uh, in some discussions that we had, like in coffee breaks and stuff like that, is, is whether um, those things are on the same scale or in the same direction. So for example, if a environment affects uh, a gene expression, is that going to be exact? Well, a higher gene expression is a higher gene expression, but the, the environment affecting the gene expression, is that the same thing as you know, gen genetic variants like affecting the, affecting the gene expression? And, and would that have the same outcome on the, on the, on the phenotypic level? Um, so those things um, we could uh, think about a little bit more when we were thinking about, you know, modeling um, G by E all the way towards complex phenotypes. Um, I can't remember that my second point. I'll wait for another round. So, so I'm going to go back to where I, where I, was, where I started. Um, but the expectation, I think, that many people, I mean, that I had was that when we look at cellular phenotype or EQTL, the cell level, and as we go up the hierarchy, based on this question, like things will integrate and maybe there's more buffering as we go up, right? Because this deleterious effect will be sort of penalized in some way. Um, but then we have this complicated trade-off where there's so much polygenicity, but also sort of in this big pickle, right? Where like, Loic, your question about um, how do we do biological experiments? Like, what does it mean in this era of such vast polygenicity? Like I, like we've all been there, right? We wrote a paper, it's polygenic architecture. Some of you ask us to validate the effect of something. And so we pick one or two winners. There was like someone swimming on the top. Uh, we, learn not, we don't learn that much more, right? If it's polygenic, by definition, there's a ton of effect that adds up to something that accounts for most of the variants. Um, and so how do we begin to integrate this, both the, the complexity at different layers and the, 
um, this vast polygenicity into biological experiment that actually teach us something beyond the prediction. For prediction is simple, right? I mean, it's not simple, sorry, it's very complicated, but we can all understand, like we, we have some framework to understand how to make a prediction in a black box of biology. But uh, if Andy wants to make a drug uh, based on this sort of polygenic goop, um, that's gonna be very hard, right? And I, I struggle with integrating these layers and then you add aging and you add like all these, these things that are gonna modify this buffering system that are robust when you're young and not so robust when you're older. And then these, poly, these polymorphism are gonna be cryptic sometime blinking in and out. So I think these are some of the challenges that I think are, are, are hunting and most pressing. I want, to, I want to kind of add to that because uh, you know I don't have a wet lab, so thinking about how to validate in silico across scales is also something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, yeah, I don't have I don't have a lot to add outside of like uh, you know you know we build models all the time. We you know we might think we have a story on on one layer, then we find another story on this, like, going up in scale on a different layer, and and that completely contradicts what we might have found on the previous layer. Um, and so you know one thing I've been thinking about you know is if you know, how do we come to more cohesive, uh, you know, uh, understanding of our results in our in, our, in, our in silico experiments when we think about, um, you know, is G by E playing a role here or is that some kind of confounding or bias from, from something else? That's something like, for instance, myself and Arbol's back there somewhere I've been thinking a lot about uh, recently with, with certain papers. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's a huge challenge as well as we think about uh, these different like multi-scale uh, type of approaches. I feel like a lot of um, not. I think it, it touches a little bit on what you were talking about just now, like on um, the integrating different layers and polygenicity. So, um, so I think a lot of work has been done over the past like decade or so to sort of identify functional annotations or sort of tissue specific gene expressions, and people have been using that as a unit for defining like um, things to test basically like against uh, diseases. So for example, you know, is um, a depression G was hits more enriched in this type of like genes expressing this type of cells or something like that. Uh, and maybe one of those, and that gets us as far as, you know, the cell types that have been um, annotated and whether that is the right level of organization that we should be cl like clustering things um, to get enrichments on is is hard to say and when do we know whether we got the right pathways and that's uh that's something that i think is one of the biggest challenges right now if you're hoping to to identify those polygenic pathways and and to use it for example for stratifying heterogeneous diseases etc yeah, I, I think that that's a great point. Um, and I, I think also, you know, as we've talked a lot about um, this morning, that um, the, those sort of annotations that we're usually using about where are these genes expressed, um, what cell type are they um, often expressed in, that those are all, you know, baseline, steady state, healthy people, um, and that, you know, and uh, I think a place the community could go is some um, sort of more uh, large scale community resources for thinking about, you know, developmental trajectories, cells in different states, um, disease states, um, different environmental states, right? I think that would be helpful for um, annotating all of these, uh, you know, polygenic um, genetics of complex traits um, lists that we have and, and thinking about their biology. I think we kind of need a poetic naturalism for genetics. So this is sort of Sean Rice's sort of concept for um, uh, Sean uh, Carroll's concept in physics. But but are there emergent properties at the organismal level that we that we wouldn't see at the cellular level? Um, I was actually to to wonder if now can expand on her comment that linking G by E to TWAS. So how how do you see that happening? Because obviously TWAS does not capture environment so what's the best way to go about that would we are we better off investing in well I'll go back up so we've probably spent over a billion dollars on GWAS to this point and maybe 10 million dollars on the sorts of functional assays that Francesca and Tully were talking about so if the NIH were to invest in this sort of research to sort of bridge from functional annotation so all the stuff that ENCODE's done bridging that now to population and quantitative genetics and you were to say well where would you spend $100 million? Would it be on cellular assays? Would it be on more and more screens of more people across environments, which would be restricted to blood, I presume? Um, with, is it doing more CRISPR assays? I think that's a really important question to address and answer. The, you know, Are we limited by data? Are we limited by theory? Well, those, those sorts of questions. Yeah, 
uh, I want to draw people's attention to a different kind of perturbogen that maybe has some things to help us learn from. It's a shocking thing to those of us who saw the GLP-1R analogs, you know, from very early days, you know, come out and be used and see how ignorant we actually were of, of how that biology was going to work, right? So these are drugs that were designed, you know, uh, followed up <clears throat> because they target incretins, should um, improve insulin secretion, should um, maybe lead to a little weight loss. That was, the, those were the early ideas. And the magnitude of effects for those drugs is shockingly greater than what, what was envisioned by the people who developed those drugs. So these drugs lead to much more weight loss than was expected and through mechanisms that were not really imagined. So much bigger hits in reward system biology because they're also expressed in the brain, not just the gut, but also improved cardiovascular risk profiles and hugely improved, I mean, in short trials, fewer cardiac events. I mean, a big deal for cardiovascular health that was not anticipated at all in the development of the drug. This is telling us really important things about how these systems are connected. And, and you know, it's, it's back to the pleiotropy, but it is, it's a drug perturbogen potentially that helps us grab hold of bigger pieces of biology that are connected that we didn't appreciate how strongly they were connected and that we should be able to use in thinking about designing experiments that help us understand these sort of cross organ, um, unexpected shared architectures, unexpected communications. Um, and the, the, so the GLP-1R is, is one thing, but the SGLT2 drugs, whose primary activity is just peeing out more glucose are having similar surprising effects in improving cardiovascular and kidney function. There's so much we don't know and understand about how by these layers of systems talk to each other. And the question of whether there's experimental things we can do like now really looking harder at, at drug perturbogens of systems, these drugs that did way more than we expected. In hindsight, could we could we look at relook at the, the animal model data and actually predict this or not? In in retrospect, would we have put these systems together in the way they they seem to be put together? Are we thinking wrong about diseases like diabetes as anything other than just part of the whole cardiometabolic system, super system. So I, I, I think also let's now start opening up to two questions from the audience. Yeah, go ahead. So um, Michelle Nivar through Amsterdam. Um, my question about the GLP-1 thing, and it's a question that's been on my mind about many things we've discussed today is like, as an epidemiologist, my intuition goes to that that's probably like 60% the weight loss improving the heart conditions, just like the action is mediated through the weight loss. To some degree, it probably goes a bit too quick to be entirely mediated by that. But like we all have different intuitions about the causal chain at different levels and they interfere with each other. Because while there might be a biological effect of GLP-1 on the heart condition that you may be able to figure out in a model system right there is at the same time massive weight loss that just has like a biological effect and that's just that's that's still a reasonably simple thing throughout the day we've been discussing sort of all these systems or how we could study parts of this system but at the same time there is causal action at every level of biology all the way up to sociology so how are we going to try and how would you how do you envision us 
trying to entangle those levels. Well, there, there is emerging data from clinical trials that the improved cardiac biomarkers way precedes the weight loss and is not accounted for um, meaningfully by the weight loss. I mean, it's way beyond what you would expect for the, for the magnitude of weight loss in terms of especially the timing. Um, but, but great point um, that BMI is, is a, a super driver of medical phenome all over the place and, and anything that's gonna affect that will have, have lots of downstream effects and how, how we disentangle that is very hard. So, yeah, so yeah. I was just gonna add, there's another example that's probably not related, well, maybe it is related to BMI, but in the opposite direction is long COVID's effect on heart yeah. disease is, is also systemic somehow in ways that you cannot predict from this great genetic. Mm -hmm. Aravinda, you have I, a question or comment? Yeah, I'm... I'm uh, Thank you. So um, I think in my mind, the question is whether, you know, many of the common questions we've asked throughout the day is best asked of every phenotype. So far, you know, we've studied phenotypes depending on our personal curiosities or whether a set of, you know, not everything is a model system. Some model systems have been better than others for what the questions were whether a certain set of phenotypes may teach us more simply for whatever the scientific you know, imperatives are. And I think we are asking very, very hard questions that I find. I think the only conclusion I came to is answering them in the absence of a particular phenotype or disease is gonna be very difficult. And it very well is possible. Some phenotypes say having to do with vascular disease is far more answerable than depression. Genetics may not be at a stage. We couldn't study complex diseases 20, 30 years ago and didn't seem to bother anybody. So why do we expect that we should be able to understand depression? And what have we done to change the probability of understanding it? So it may be helpful to hear whether there are specific questions and specific paradigms that would help us understand each of the questions. Just, just a random thought and your response. I, to, I took a class in urban planning and urban policy last year, just for the heck of it. And the, the professor started out by, by talking about cities and the, the architecture of the cities and the street plans and how open streets were and what impact that had on crime and so forth. And he said, um, you know, there's no point breaking it down into its component parts because you're never going to understand the city by putting them back together. There's nothing more complex than the city. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, the brain's pretty complex, the immune system's pretty complex, and we're breaking it down to its component parts and sort of assuming we can just put our understanding back together once we have those parts and their effect sizes. And so his starting point was, there's no point even trying that we can just take little bits of the city and understand that, you know, better sight lines prevent crime. And, and we don't do that. So, so that's again, coming back to the question of emergent properties and thinking about that. Just around the thought. So um, this is Aaron Panofsky. I have a question back here in the back. Um, my question is basically, how do we even think about um, uh, doing these kinds of studies in a changing world where there's changing rates of changing incidences of disease, changing sort of environmental context in the broadest sense when we spent the day sort of talking about how we don't really know what an environment is? 
I, I'm just thinking about something that might be even seen as relatively tractable, like addiction or something like that. But we have, um, you know, a, a vastly changing landscape of uh, which people become addicted, which drugs are available, which uh, forms of addiction um, end up killing people versus which end up being sort of chronic and manageable. And so, you know, so we might think, okay, there's a genetic architecture, genetic underpinning to addiction, to opiate addiction. Um, that's, that's great. But how do we, how do we even think about identifying what genetic variants are in a, in a changing context like this, right? So if we uh, did a GWAS in, okay, here's a, maybe a concrete way to put it. I'm not sure if this is the best example, but if you do a GWAS in 2023 and you did a GWAS in 1970, uh, would would it be the same thing? Um, and and if if yes, if no, I mean, how do how do we then even think about what genetics is doing um, or what the genetics of complex traits is doing uh, with those sort of thought examples? That is a great example. If you did a if you could do a GWAS in 1970 for cardiovascular for myocardial infarction, cardiovascular disease you would definitely see much more of the LDL-based component than you will today because statins treat that component of risk for myocardial infarction so effectively. And that, so that's part, part of the distinction between prediction and, and what we can learn from GWAS and, and how environments and drugs are going to, you know, to the extent genetics works and we pick off variants that we can use to improve health, things will continue to change. I mean, they will, they will be radically different. When you look at, at GWAS of the modern data, you can hardly see the LDL signal compared to things like LP little a, because that's, that's what's driving events in people who are on statins. So I, I think, yes, we have to be aware of the dynamic part of the world that we control, but then of course, there's the whole dynamic part of the world that we, we don't control and we don't understand. And that's, yeah. So just a small, a small comment. Like, so I, I come from the model system world, I work in flies and, and people can do experiment. I can take the exact same population and change the environment and do a, a GWAS on the same trait and look at how different the architecture is. Many people are doing these kind of things. And it's, it is quite dramatically different, right? The amount of cryptic genetic variation that get revealed um, is, is substantial. So to your point, yes, it's a, it's a moving target, right? I think that's what you're pointing out, right? Um, and that goes back, as you just pointed, like what are, what are we trying to understand? For prediction, it doesn't matter, right? It's in the context of that population at that time. But for the context of understanding the biological basis of the variation in depressive behavior, um, that's a that makes a huge difference. Um, yeah. So if most of what we're seeing is changing over time, and we have these dynamics that are dependent on like what heart attacks even are at different times, then I was wondering about this earlier too in the last session. But like, how much of polygenicity is literally just time, like traits that take longer? to generate or traits that take the develop over a longer period of time are just ones that are more polygenic. And it just so happens that there's a lot of these intermediate phenotypes that are short time scales, but most of them are, are most of the larger scale traits that we're looking at that are organismal level develop over the course of many years. And so as a result of that, they have more time. There's more environmental exposures. There's more variance as a result of the fact that the society and the culture that we're living within is changing. Like how much of this is just capturing that? I don't have the answer, but I think that's a great uh, question and a great way to think about it. Um, I think we also can't disentangle, um, you know, age and time from sort of accumulated environmental exposures, right? Those are always going to be entirely correlated. And a lot of the complex traits that we're interested in and these complex diseases are diseases of aging, diseases that creep up later in the lifetime. Um, and we often can't really disentangle sort of biology being different, the body being different, things breaking down over time with just you've now lived for 70 years experiencing many different environments and your, um, you know, your body has sort of taken that. So I, I don't know, but I love that idea of sort of thinking about it um, as time. <laughs>
So I think I'm going to echo Greg's question. People can consider this a homework question because I think this is part of what Jen's going to come back tomorrow. But like from, you know, from the NHGRI perspective, we're often thinking like, what is, what is missing that we could help stimulate or what is missing that we can, you know, we can, that could help fill some of these gaps. And I, two things that I'm hearing that I'm interested in, one is like, just like, are there resources missing or in certain, you know, are we only, you know, the, it's that lamppost thing. Are we looking at the places that are well annotated and is that biasing what we're finding? And, you know, is some of this coming up with less biased annotations? But then to come to your point, Greg, how do we get those integrated views, right? If we want to be not just looking at the parts, but coming across systems, you know, something that's equivalent to sight lines, what are the things that we could help allow those types of views to be better, better seen or better pulled out in versus what we currently have in terms of existing methods, existing data, existing resources? Because I don't have the answer to either of those questions, so I'd love some input. <laughs> well, well, looking at it across populations, like Amanda's doing, is great, but then that's complicated by ancestry. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll definitely sort of plug that I think that um, even when we're thinking about uh, the environments that we are often thinking about the environments that we experience in the US or in sort of in the global north, right? And there's a much larger range of environments that are um, true across the world. Uh, in some cases, that is going to be, you know, confounded by ancestry, but I think that you know, larger scale sampling, larger scale incorporation of diverse environments and, and including environments that are more similar often to those in which humans evolved, right? From a sort of um, thinking about uh, the evolutionary history of humans, the environments that we are currently assaying people in are, are very weird. Um, are, they're very novel relative to sort of what the body has seen through time. Um, so I do think that there's more that we could be doing in that space. Yeah, I had a question. Oh, sorry if you're going to. Go ahead, no. Hi, John. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. Of course. Yeah, no, I, I, I have a jumble of answers to various things that was raised yeah. earlier. So I feel like uh, Aravinder's um, comment just now about like different diseases being at different stages of investigation, and we we understand very, you know, uh, different amounts about those diseases from the same kind of or the same mag well. Um, amount of genetic data we that we seem to have accumulated over the past number of years. Um, for example, you know, mental health disorders versus, for example, cardiovascular disease or, or, or um, other more biologically understood things. Not only is it that we don't, uh, it's a more complex phenotype, is is less um, well-defined and the genetics is more complex. We also understand the neuro neuroscience not, not as well as, as all of these other things. Like the brain is, um, we do understand less about the workings of the brain than maybe of, for example, certain other systems. So maybe that also needs to catch up a little bit. And 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 one of the maybe one of the goals that geneticists could you know aspire to is 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 can we potentially hypothesize some of those models? Like let's say, you know, we, we're not neuroscientists, we can't, we don't actually know what's going on. We can't experimentally test a lot of things. But let's say we we are we, we can come up with a hypothesis of how things work and then we can test it using genetics. We probably will be wrong, but then at least we know that that is wrong and then we can go on to test the next thing. And, uh, and if we kept doing that, you know, in a reasonable way, then hopefully, hopefully we'll get closer to the, to the nature of the disease. Um, and, and that's, I think, beginning to happen with the mental health disorders, um, uh, using genetics as a tool to test whether our disease phenotype is actually right or not. Um, and that might be an interesting direction. And then the other jumbled answer is, um, is uh, I think Greg asked me just now about Jibai and, and Nancy said something about um, per the perturbation of a drug uh, that seemed to have way larger effects um, on more than one phenotype. And, and that could be just, you know, that also ties in with something that I was thinking about earlier, whether you know, perturbed uh, gene expression levels or perturbed molecular phenotypes, are those the same things as, uh, I think that was what I tried to explain, but not very well, that's why it caused confusion. Um, uh, whether that's the same thing as genetically um, uh, regulated uh, molecular differences between people. And um, 
And that's both in terms of magnitude and in terms of like how widely it affects. So maybe, you know, if we could, if we're doing large scale G by E or large scale per G by treatment or G by other perturbations, uh, if we identify those molecular phenotypes that is affected by this, and then that could, for example, be the unit uh, that we want to test things uh, going forward. Just a suggestion. Yeah, I just kind of want to add to that. Um, it, yeah, so first I'm hearing this idea of like, you know, diversity on different axes and thinking about those different definitions of diversity, not even just ancestry, but, you know, other ways that we can uh, think about stratifying different populations. One, to answer this question about like how to think about investments, you know, um, I come from a machine learning world. Uh, you know, one thing that we're doing right now, I think everyone's heard this term foundation models, which I think is like a kind of interesting idea, which is, you know, this idea where you have a model, you train it on something and it is able to generalize in many different spaces. Uh, foundation models are really good in language because language we see in all contexts. And I think what I learned today is that we are nowhere near that in this space right now, there's infinite many contexts. But in language, it's very simple. If I take a punctuation mark and I, and I move it like a comma to a different part of the sentence, I know exactly how the syntax of that sentence has changed. Right and GPT and these other these other methodologies are very good at generalizing that because it understands all contexts. Whether you ask it certain things in certain tones in certain ways, it can infer that even though they hadn't seen it. Right, um, and you know, in biology we're we're just not there yet. Right, right. We're thinking we're saying today we just don't have enough of these of of contextualizations to kind of know if I change the comma right, quote unquote, in the sentence, like how things might generalize. Um, and so I came today thinking like, oh, maybe I'll figure this out here. And right? but now I'm kind of like. Maybe we just need to start somewhere to answer your funding question. Like this idea that you you want to fund this, uh, you know, you know, perturbations enough that allow, or you know, experiments that, that explain perturbations that then allow us to generalize to other places. Um, and so maybe that's another way to kind of think about it. And you know, Microsoft is not to give away Microsoft secrets or anything, but Microsoft is thinking about this idea of like what are scaling laws for different modalities in different application spaces, right? And so you think about like how many tokens of words or tokenizations of words do I need in a sentence in order to be able to generalize across many different languages. You can think about this, you could do this also with sequences and proteins. You can think about this also in terms of perturbation space, whether you're thinking about setting G by G, G by E um, across different populations. And maybe that's where you should start. Yeah. So um, I was gonna ask on the topic of like polygenicity, which we've been circling around. The omnigenic model has that idea in it of the core pathway and the peripheral pathway, and it hasn't come up yet today. And I was sort of wondering about that. It, it has maybe some connections to Thule's idea of like points of convergence. Maybe is that sort of core pathway? That'd be interesting to explore that a little more, and also in the context maybe of hierarchy of you know core pathways, maybe at different hierarchies. But I, I think I I love that question because I think it also comes back to one of the things we talked about this morning with respect to whether the the ways that the, the biology of environment non-genetic exposures work does it layer right on the biology we know generally or or is are there way more ways that that we might learn biology by by exploring those things and so i that, that's actually one of the things i'd say in answer to caroline's question i do think we would benefit uh, this as a society from understanding more about whether the biology of non-genetic factors really will just reinforce biology we know, or at least, and maybe for more complex phenotypes with more ways that the environment can affect them, that we'll learn new kinds of bio, you know, new pieces of biology that that would be particularly useful and I I so I don't mean to hijack your question because I think it's it's a great question all by itself but it is related to that concept um also that that we discussed this morning um John um I think maybe the um uh so the core uh Carmen what the word is core and um peripheral uh, regulatory networks um, in, in, in the om omnigenics model. Um, so that's norm, that's at the moment, I think most EQTL studies are done on non-diseased um, cells, 
like tissues for like or non-specified not sure not specifically for any disease there are disease data sets coming up now so maybe one of the interesting things going forward to to look i think is um noah has a paper on this like some years ago about regulatory de i think he called it regulatory decoherence or something like that so maybe you know um in some disease states there are um perturbed um core versus peripheral um regulation networks and that may um, be important to the pathology of the disease, that might be an interesting thing to look into. So um, one comment I wanted to make that relates perhaps to, to John's comment as well as, well as to the, the prompt about genetic architecture across levels of biological organization is that, um, you know, with the, the tool of GWAS, we're, we're very good at identifying um, SNP to end trait or, or disease association. So we, we can we can measure very, very, very small effects very reliably and repeatably. But it's it's extremely difficult for us to um, learn about how those effects are flowing through um, different levels of biological organization. So so for example, um, if you think about you know somebody with a high polygenic risk score for some trait, what what does that do to cellular states for example so so how do those how do those effects flow through gene regulatory networks how do they change the um the the states of 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 t cells or you know what, what have they affected cell type is uh, and you know how do those affect tissues and an organism level function and um like we you know we, we we can we can measure whole body phenotypes um, extremely efficiently in huge numbers of individuals, but it's extremely difficult for us to to measure um, a lot of meaningful phenotypes at uh, at cell and tissue level. Um, and and I you know I, I think I think that some of the, these things we can we can try to get out with with experimental approaches like um, uh, you know CRISPR perturbations in in cellular systems rather than having to do this, the same sorts of measurements in enormous sample sizes. But anyway, I think that this is a huge gap to, in terms of how to, how to fill in the sort of the, the causal pathway steps from, from genotype to, to, to phenotype and, and you know, sort of thinking about the ensemble of effects rather than um, you know, sort of a one dimensional arrow from, from, from genotype to end phenotype. Thanks. So just to ask back to you, Jonathan, if we if we had um, a whole repertoire of iPSCs differentiated into lots of different cell types from people in far tales of polygenic liability distributions, how much of the the biology of polygenicity would we explain? At ju with just having the cellular information on on people in far tails and, and you know maybe mid ranges of polygenic liability to any disease and how much would would we have to have this across levels of tissue and system to see anything at all? I mean that, that's so that, that's part of the question that that is so hard to get at here and that we don't have yet, but we might have pieces of it. Yeah, so I think these are fundamental challenges we don't know know the answers to really. So, um, uh, you know, as one example, um, you know, our lab's been very interested in in trying to um, do uh, 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 perturbed seek, you know, CRISPR perturbations of, of individual genes, try to build gene regulatory networks, and then understand, you know, in a very specific cell type, um, what are the kinds of effects that variants that show up in GWAS have, you know, which parts of the gene regulatory network are most often perturbed? Can we identify downstream genes that may be having um, causal effects in the, in the rest of the biological system? And, you know, I, I, I personally think that's a, a useful first step, but at the same time, it is, is really only a, a very first step. It's, it's like getting one, one step away from, uh, you know, so it's a cis EQTL sort of linked variant to, to the nearest gene. This is getting one step further and trying to understand how those effects are flowing through regulatory networks within the same cells. 
Um, but anyway, I think there's a, an enormous amount of space for progress on this, but they're, they're difficult problems. Okay, um, I had, I heard echo, um, a comment about the, the concept of time with what we're looking at as well, sort of looking at the cityscape versus parts of it. And there's a really good example of how time changes things with COVID. There was a GWAS of COVID. And if you look over the first couple of years of the results, they change with time. And they change rather drastically in some loci. And that's partly because of more numbers, but partly because who was infected changed, who was exposed changed, and then who sort of got hospitalized changed from various things. And so you see a very accelerated version of this. And so my question, I guess, for us to think about in terms of levels of biological organization is that we have a pretty good idea of how micro we want to get in terms of the scale, but really how macro do we think is relevant to go to understand these different levels and how it informs the biology and the genetic architecture of traits because I think it's a very sort of informative framework to, to think about and sort of necessary for us to move beyond even an individual and towards populations and societies and sort of how that influences even the basic biology of what matters. We have, we have buses that we have to catch. So we have to bring this session to a close and um, I have the unenviable task of trying to summarize all these discussions today. So I'm just, I, I, I think this last round table came back to a lot of the things that were discussed earlier. Um, so I, I don't think we need the, the big summary. I think we, um, there were a lot of interesting discussions related to pleiotropy, to selection, um, to these levels of organization and, and how we need to improve our understanding. Um, also on the, on the analytic ends, the, the ways that our questions shape the models that we consider, the way that the models that we've already built shape the questions we ask. So, we have, there are, all, are always tautologies. You think the right thing to do is the thing you can do now, but, um, but that's not true. <laughs> and so we, if we persevere uh, in further discussions tomorrow, one of the things we really should be focusing on is what, what we wish we had in the way of, of better models, what we wish we had in the way of additional kinds of data. And I, I agree. Um, we need more data at a variety of different levels. And I, I think that the, the CRISPR perturbations, other kinds of perturbations are helpful. And we saw that with Francesca's um, presentations. And it was striking how similar the results of Michelle's studies were to, I think, the ways that we've been seeing genetic architecture come out for some human quantitative traits. So I think Naomi had, had it exactly right, that there will be parallels across systems in the way genetic architectures work. And can we do a better job of harnessing that information to help us with some of our questions in genetic architecture? And um, with that, I mean, we really need those drink tickets, so. So there is a reception five to seven in the hotel, in the democracy room of the hotel. So if you're staying at the hotel, you received two drink tickets that you can use at the at the bar. If you're not staying at the hotel and you're local, you're more than welcome to join us. That is the NBC Suites uh, on Democracy Boulevard, just uh, up the street. Uh, it's a short walk. If you want to walk back to the hotel, you can walk or you can take the shuttle uh, back to the hotel, which will leave now. <laughs>
Um, also, if you're checking out tomorrow, you can bring your bag with you here. We can store it here uh, near the kitchen. All right, so see you all in a bit. <laughs>